Welcome to Broad Eye, the podcast that explores knowledge gaps in ophthalmology and eye care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Broad Eye Podcast. My name is Sean Maloney, and today I will be interviewing Dr. Jose Ale Sahel. Dr. Sahel is, uh, holds the titles of Chair and Professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He's also the Director of the UPMC uh, Eye Center and the Eye and Ear Foundation Endowed Chair in Ophthalmology, and also holds the title Professor at Sorbonne University in Paris. Dr. Sahel, welcome to the podcast. Hello, good morning. So we're going to dive into some of uh, some pretty exciting stuff in your recent research publication in Nature Medicine. But before we do, I was hoping you could give the audience a little bit of an overview of what optogenetics is and also um, how opt- optogenetics can potentially offer mutation-independent therapies uh, in certain eye conditions, including retinitis pigmentosa. Yes, th- thank you. So optogenetics is a field that uh, emerged uh, in the early 2000. Uh, at the time, scientists working on uh, algae and uh, mostly biophysicists working on uh, signal transduction identified that uh, algae were benefiting from a very rudimentary but extremely robust mechanism to detect light changes and to be able to react to light changes. Namely, they have a cilium and they are able to move or shrink uh, in response to light. And this is due to the fact that these uh, species, uh, very uh, early in evolution species, are hovering at the surface of the membrane proteins that are able to capture the light, absorb the light, and uh, trigger a change in uh, membrane potential, electrical membrane potential, namely depolarization or hyperpolarization. And uh, this is how they react. So only one protein is able to do that. And uh, this is an extremely robust mechanism that has been conserved throughout evolution. At that time, it was an interesting finding for a marine biologist. And a neuroscientist thought that this could be a very good tool to monitor and also to control neuronal activity, because as you know, neurons are functioning by change in membrane potential. They are depolarizing, or in the case of photoreceptors, they are hyperpolarizing. And so this change of potential at the surface of neurons is a very important part of the neuronal activity. So uh, as early as uh, 2002 and three, when the, the scientists at the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt, uh, Ernst Bamberg, Peter Hegemann and uh, Nagel identified these proteins, it was felt that this could be a really good uh, tool in neuroscience. And uh, very prominent neuroscientists like Carl Deserot at Stanford and Ed Boyden used that as a very nice way to study circuits in, in the brain and in peripheral systems. At that time, uh, the idea that this could be used as a therapeutic tool was pretty remote. And uh, until this year, most people believe that it was a wonderful tool for science, but that was it. Uh, in uh, 2006, uh, a scientist in Detroit and in parallel, Boton uh, Roska in Basel and then myself thought about this idea of using this tool to activate the retina in patients where the sensitivity to light had been lost as a consequence of uh, gene mutations, like this occurs in uh, very advanced stages of retinitis pigmentosa. In that group of disease, the photoreceptors that are normally capturing the light and uh, triggering a, a list of uh, responses, biochemical and then electrical responses. These photoreceptors are carrying mutations, different types of mutation, that make them unable to respond properly to light. And eventually they do degenerate. And uh, this is leading to loss of uh, dark adapted vision initially, and then secondarily to loss of central and light adapted vision, and potentially uh, to blindness. So we thought that uh, this type of proteins, if we could express them in uh, the remaining cells in the retina of patients affected with advanced retinitis pigmentosa, this could potentially restore light sensitivity. And then given that the rest of the circuitry in the retina and in the brain 
is still not intact, but quite well performing, could be a good way to restore some form vision. So initially, uh, Pan in Detroit uh, used uh, the first protein that was identified and showed some uh, nice responses in, in models, in animal models. The issue was, and this happened also to be the case, I think, when they tried to transfer that in the clinic, but the amount of light that is necessary to activate these proteins is massive. It's like staring at the sun in, in the desert on a very shiny day. So this is something which is not possible and can be dangerous, toxic to original cells. So with Boton Roska, at the time when most people thought this would never work, we, we thought that we should have a very systematic plan to try to bring this approach to the clinic and uh, to develop an, a series of uh, tweaks and tools that could make it a realistic approach for patients. So if you want, I can get into all the specifics of the work that we conducted with Boton and with my team at, in Paris and now in Pittsburgh to really transform this approach, which is really activating neurons by light into a way to restore some form vision. No, I mean, this is a, that's a great overview. And yeah, I'd like to dive into it a bit deeper. But before we do, I just wanted to uh, let me put a question out there. So these proteins are initially identified in these algae that are responding to light, um, as you uh, mentioned earlier on. Are these very similar to, you know, opsin proteins that you find in the human retina already? Uh, so these proteins uh, are totally absent for human retina. From human retina, they are, uh, I would say, the ancestor of the uh, transduction that we have in uh, normal uh, human retina, in mammalians in general. In uh, humans, uh, we have a type of protein that is called opsin, rhodopsin, or conopsins. These proteins uh, are carrying uh, a derivative of vitamin A called the retinal that uh, changes uh, shape in response to light. And this is triggering a, a list of activation of uh, other proteins. This is called visual transduction. And this is amplifying the signal by 1 million. One photon eventually ends up to, with to the activation of 1 million channels at the membrane. The protein we are talking about, the optogenetic proteins, one photon would activate one channel. So the, the amplitude of a response is far less, but at the same time, you have only one protein that does the job of uh, hundreds of proteins in, uh, or I would say tens of proteins in the human or mammalian retina. So it's using, uh, I would say, uh, some sort of uh, synthetic biology. This is something which is not coming from humans. It's coming from algae, but it's a protein. And uh, the goal is to express it in the retina. What is this protein from algae called? So the first one was called channel rhodopsin, and now there is okay. a list of names uh, of to these proteins. There are the channel or heterodopsin. Channel rhodopsin depolarize the membrane. Heterodopsin hyperpolarize the membrane because the channel rhodopsin are coupled with uh, sodium uh, channels mostly, or sometimes calcium, but uh, sodium channels. Whereas heterodopsin are coupled with uh, chloride pumps and they create hypopolarization. Maybe it's uh, to be too detailed, but uh, these are the names of the, the, more, the most classical protein. Okay, no, that makes it a little bit more clear as well. Now, um, so how can these, or, or why are these uh, proteins using these, um, you know, these opsin-like proteins better than trying to use, you know, ops, you know rot, rot opsin or cone opsins um, that exists in the human retina is, you know, why is it that we can't just, you know, try to um, cause, you know, the remaining retina like ganglion cells to express rod, rod, rhodopsin and conopsin instead? Yeah, so some groups are trying that. Uh, so this is a sensible approach. Problem is that it's a uh, rhodopsin, for example, is a pretty big protein. And uh, second, you need to restore not only the activity of this protein, but also the activation of the transduction cascade, which is a very fragile series of uh, proteins. So it's a, it's a possibility, and uh, actually this is being attempted. Uh, people are trying to build constructs that comprise part of these opsins and uh, other parts that would activate the membrane. So trying to benefit from the light sensitivity that does exist uh, in nature, in mammalian retina. But uh, the responses can be a bit slow. And uh, the other issue that we 
probably we should discuss at some point is the amount of light uh, that you would need, uh, knowing that in normal life we are adjusting to many levels of light. We, we function in very low levels of light, but we also function in very high levels of light, and we need to adjust to that. So the point would be not just to bring back the rod up scene, but you would have to bring actually a lot of the machinery. And you have to remember that we are talking about patients that lost photoreceptors. So we are talking about neurons that don't have a rest of a transduction cascade, and you would have to restore or to express part of that or replace some of that too. So it's not impossible, and groups are working on that. Uh, and if, if we have time, we can certainly discuss that. But uh, it's not like one protein does everything, which is the beauty of the approach we are describing today. Uh, for sure, and I'm sure that there's, you know, um, you know, obstacles and, well, yeah, just, I guess, obstacles whenever you think about taking something that is normally expressed in, you know, rod or cone cells, trying to express it in ganglion cells and just trying to ignore that there are other cell types that sit you know, in the normal retina between those two cell types that are integral to that, to that process. So is that, I guess, on that side of things, whenever you're getting these ganglion cells to express uh, any kind of uh, opsin or opsin-like protein, is there a, you know, a time frame or not a time frame, I guess, is there a process where the brain has to reorganize or kind of relearn to see because it doesn't have those same filtering mechanisms that would normally be in, in place for, uh, for vision? Well, certainly yes. And uh, probably we should get to that uh, when we describe the trial because uh, there is a rehabilitation process, there is a learning process, the type of uh, images that are restored are not normal images, classical images, and uh, many of these patients lost vision for many years or decades, and in our case for this patient it was more than 15 years of blindness, so certainly the brain has to adjust to that. But actually, uh, before we speak about that, uh, I have to say that we try to keep as much as we could the existing uh, visual processing in the in the human visual system. So we worked on, uh, for example, reactivating the remaining cone cells because in uh, several patients with advanced retinitis pigmentosa, the cones uh, are still present and uh, we call that dormant cones because they don't have all the transduction, but they are still there and they are connected to the rest of the retina of the visual system. So we actually, we published a paper we got on in science in 2010 showing that this was working. And this was initially the, what we thought would be a very promising approach. The limitations are that uh, it's only less than 20% of the patient that have his remaining cones. And the second one is that uh, to target efficiently the cells to the membrane was a bit of a challenge. We also tried uh, to target the intermediate cells in the system, like the bipolar cells, and we published several papers, but on did also actually publish on that. Uh, and uh, it worked beautifully in mouse models. The issue is that as of today, uh, there is no good way to translate that to mammalians, the type of vectors and the efficiency is, is still pretty low. There is a group in uh, Switzerland, I think, with uh, Sonia uh, Ken Nagel, which is working on that, and Vogel working on that, so maybe this is going to work in the future. The reason we use the ganglion cells, despite a couple of caveats, is that uh, these cells are remaining uh, alive and uh, potentially functional even in very advanced stages of retinitis pigmentosa. So the number of patients that could be benefiting from that is pretty large. And also they are directly connected to the brain, so it's a, it's a quick way to activate the visual system. The limitation is that in the normal retina, we have uh, more than 12 different types of ganglion cells, each of them responding to different types of light stimuli. And clearly, with this approach, we are targeting all of them at the same time. So the type of signal can be a bit confusing, and this is where the brain and the training is important to make sense out of it. Also, the type of stimulations we are sending can cope with some of this issue, but the cell specificity that we have with this approach is currently limited. But obviously, we know that the place where we see is the brain, so we have to provide a signal that the brain can use and can be trained to interpret properly and adapt for action or understanding. 
So maybe I can describe a bit uh, the different parts of the technology. The first part was uh, the protein itself, the optogenetic protein itself. Uh, we discussed about the initial proteins that were identified and the amount of light that is needed to, to stimulate them. So we tried to find a way to reduce that uh, to be in a range that would be non-toxic because the last thing you want to do is to destroy the remaining cells in the patient's retina. And uh, for that, we explored different ways. Uh, initially, a modified tenorhodopsin that uh, Ernst Barnberg at, in Frankfurt had produced called uh, CATCH that was working very nicely, but still required a significant amount of light. And then we found out that uh, Roger Chen in California, the Nobel laureate had developed a protein that is shifted into the red. And he, he shared that with us and we tested it, worked nicely. Uh, and we published actually, actually on that. Uh, but we also heard from uh, Ed Boyden at MIT that he had developed a new family of protein that was really shifted quite nicely into the amber and the red and very efficient in terms of light responses. So we decided to try this and to model the activity. And eventually we decided that the best would be the one called the Crimson R that is shifted into the amber. So it's a low energy light, requires a level of light that is far less than the classical channel and uh, it's totally in the range of non-toxic uh, stimulation, and we checked that. Uh, and so this was an important step. Then we had to develop the vector, the gene therapy vector, which is a, a modified virus, non-pathogenic, doesn't induce any disease, but would express uh, these proteins in ganglion cells. And so we went through different trials, actually a very systematic approach conducted by Denis Dalcara in Paris. And eventually we ended up having a construct that uh, provided us with very good results in the mouse, in the rat, and then in primate retina, and in the post-mortem human retina. So we, we found that it was working nicely. Uh, the recording were performed with stimulation on single cells, on multiple cells, using also biphoton microscopy, so optical imaging with uh, calcium changes, and eventually a very new technology developed by uh, Valentina Emiliani in Paris, which, which is using holographic digital imaging. All of these technologies were used not for the sake of technology, but for the sake of trying to see whether visual processing that was uh, obtained after stimulation was meaningful and could lead to a, a useful type of vision. And uh, then using uh, computational neuroscience to model the type of signal, we found and published uh, in PLOS Computational Biology a couple of two years ago, and more recently in the Communication Biology, that the signal was meaningful and with a pretty good uh, resolution so that patient potentially could use it. So this was the first step, really developing the, identifying the protein, developing the vector, and showing that we could get a good stimulation. The second part of the technology was to find how to stimulate with uh, an amount of light and the type of signal that would be efficient. Uh, and for that, we developed uh, goggles that are sending the light onto the eye in the wavelength that corresponds to crimson R, so in the amber spectrum. Uh, and this is monochromatic light, so it's not color vision. And uh, also because uh, the idea was to replace uh, the processing that occurs in the retina, we decided to use and develop a type of cameras that is uh, different from the classical cameras, that we call frame cameras, that are more or less taking frames one after the other, pictures one after the other. Uh, using a, a type of camera that works like the human retina and the human brain, namely detecting changes. Each pixel is independent in these cameras, and the, each pixel is detecting any change in lighting uh, from very low levels of light to high levels of light, functioning in the total range of uh, the light we have in daily life, and uh, being able to respond uh, pixel by pixel. So these cameras are called uh, bio-inspired or biomimetic or event-based cameras. They were invented by uh, Delbruck in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, Austria, and uh, Christoph Bosch. And uh, one of the scientists at the time at the Vision Institute, uh, Real Benosment, with Serge Pico, developed them to adapt that for optogenetics. So the goggles comprise this type of cameras. 
that are extremely light efficient, that are also uh, providing a lot of uh, pre-computational uh, processing that is very important. And this is coupled with a projector that is sending the light into the eye of the animal or the patient. So because all of these technologies uh, required a lot of skills, both at the biotherapy level and at the technological level, we had to form a company to be able to bring all the talents into one single entity because there is no company currently that does both medical device and uh, uh, biotherapies, at least I don't know of any. And so this was uh, Genside Biologics. And uh, the nice thing is that they were very daring like we were. And uh, we spent several years to optimize the, the system. This was leading to, after a lot of safety studies in animals and a lot of uh, try and error and uh, nothing like a linear progress, but a lot of uh, back and forth uh, uh, test and trial and error and fix uh, to get to something that had a good chance to work in patients. And uh, so this uh, moved us into the clinical trial that started uh, a bit more than two years ago. And uh, a third part of the technologies that uh, was needed is rehabilitation. You alluded to that a moment ago, asking about how the brain will learn how to use that. And so in, in Paris and now in Pittsburgh, I have developed a, a platform to really test the daily life activities for low vision or blind patients so that we can really monitor what happens in daily life with the input from patients themselves, develop uh, experimental paradigms to test uh, many circumstances of daily life, and uh, more importantly, to monitor and to quantify the impact on mobility, on eye-hand coordination, uh, and obviously also all the quality of life metrics that are so important. So patient reported outcomes, performance-based tests, all of that was implemented. So the trial comprised a very significant component relating to the patient themselves and trying to help them to use the, potentially vision, the potential vision we would try to restore. So this, this leads us to the clinical trial that maybe I can get into if you want. Well, no, of, of, of course, like, I think, uh, you know, that's a natural, a natural segue is just going into the, the clinical trial that was done. And this is, uh, as long as we're referring to the same thing, this is uh, the one that was just published at the, near the end of May in Nature Medicine, correct? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So this was preceded by many papers uh, on the preclinical work, like uh, it's, it's uh, altogether, it's almost 15 years of work, but uh, at least 12 years of publications uh, in, uh, on the preclinical stage. So the trial was started uh, as a safety trial, uh, dose escalation, initially with low levels of the vector and the protein and uh, ramping up depending on safety. Uh, the trial was a multi trial with uh, Paris, London and Pittsburgh and uh, started around two years and a half ago. Uh, and uh, we knew that it would take around uh, four to six months for the protein to be optimally expressed in ganglion cells. And we knew that there was a need for training the patient to use the goggles because they, these patients don't see anything. So we couldn't see any light from the goggles. And uh, so to teach them how to align them and to make them useful, was kind of a challenge. So, uh, so the trial started, and in the um, first cohort of patients, actually the first patient treated in Paris, after 10, 11 months, started to report that uh, with the goggles, he couldn't see anything, but with, with the goggles, he could see a couple of things that he was not able to see before. Uh, namely, uh, he was able to see the crosswalks in the street. And uh, at home, he was able to detect, for example, his uh, hair in the mirror, but he, was, he had not been able to see for 15 years. This patient had been diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa when he was a teenager. His parents didn't tell him about it. He discovered it by himself when he was a young adult, he was a very successful professional. And uh, when he turned 40, uh, became totally blind, so couldn't walk, was falling, and so his life changed dramatically. He was able to adjust to that very very well, actually. Very uh, positive thinking patient and very uh, forward-looking patient. So, uh, but when he was 43, I think he lost all vision. This was like 15 years ago. Uh, so he got into the trial and uh, he started to report that he could see uh, something white moving in the mirror in the bathroom. And he found out that this was his hair. And his hair had been, the last time he had seen his hair, it was dark, it was black, and now it was white. 
uh, and uh, also he was able to see the crosswalk. So he was brought to this platform that I just described called the Street Lab that we built in Paris and now in Pittsburgh, where we monitor daily activities very precisely. And uh, so the patient could detect edges of the table. He could uh, start to detect small objects and larger objects like a, no a notebook, a tumbler, uh, small boxes. And he was able to count how many of them he could, there was on the table to grasp them well with accuracy and uh, a couple of other things like that so it's not uh, 2020 vision but uh, it's uh, far better than what he had before because he had nothing uh, and this required a lot of training uh, and a lot of exchange with the team and currently uh, as i used to say in these trials these patients are scientists they are experimentalists they are teaching us because no primate, no mouse is able to tell us anything like that. The human experience is, uh, is absolutely key in this type of trials. And so the patient is teaching us uh, what he perceives. Uh, for example, he could tell us that the alignment of the beam was not perfect. It was tilted uh, by 15 degrees. He, is, he was a sailor, so he, knew, he knows exactly about angles and uh, all of this. And so he was telling us a lot of things on how to improve actually the goggles. And we are using his feedback on that. Unfortunately, when he reported the first uh, vision results, uh, COVID started to hit. It was in February 2020. So everything was put on hold. Uh, all the other patients couldn't come back to the hospitals to be tested. And even this patient uh, couldn't come back for several months and came back again, then again the second wave in France and the third wave. So this has impacted very significantly the research. So this is why we reported only on one patient. But uh, to make sure that the data we were measuring were accurate, we repeated the experimentation several times at different time points. And also we performed, thanks to Angelo Arleo's team at the Vision Institute, a cortical recording using high resolution electron cephalography and de demonstrated that we could uh, measure and record uh, activity in the visual cortex in response to object detection. And so this is the paper that was published in Nature Medicine that made the news uh, a month ago. Yeah. So you know, and this is fascinating, and I have I have a, a number of follow up questions here. So um, first of all, when uh, when looking at that paper, and you pointed out in um, in your description that there was um, a time frame of from, from the time point of time zero of surgery to the time where the, the patient would really be reporting any of the visual benefits while we're in the goggles. Uh, it looks like there's two components to that delay. One for the ganglion cells to express the protein, um, and two for the you know the the training for the patient to you know learn to see. I guess I don't know if you could maybe you just elaborate on both of those to provide a little a little clarity. Yeah, that's right. So the, the protein uh, in gene therapy, you are injecting the DNA that is coding for the protein. Normally, with an adenosated virus, it takes uh, several weeks uh, to, to get the protein expressed, but it needs also to be targeted to the membrane of the ganglion cells. And uh, while in the animals uh, that we studied, and we studied a lot, uh, it was clear that you needed at least four months to get efficient transduction and up to six months to get to really the most efficient. So this part is uh, like the biological part of that. The other part, which is biology, but in a different sense, is a computational uh, ability. And as I said, we are uh, expressing the protein in uh, any type of ganglion cells, not all of them, but uh, any type. So the type of signal can be confusing. It's like telling someone uh, yes and no at the same time. So it's better than not saying anything, but uh, then people have to make sense out of it. And one way to make sense is uh, to move the eye or to move the head in order to change the stimulation uh, so that uh, it becomes uh, more discriminative, it becomes more accurate. And so the patient had to be trained to align the beam onto the eye, knowing that he couldn't see anything initially. And so the beam had to be aligned. And then the parameters of stimulation had to be adjusted so that uh, it could provide a, a more precise signal to the patient. So I can't explain why took a couple of months. Now, that when we talk with the patient, he says that actually he could start to see after four months or six months, but 
it uh, it was very confusing. So he got it took him some time to make sense out of it. And I have similar experience from artificial retina when we were using the August two or the Iris two technology uh, in patients. It would take them some time to understand what they were seeing. Uh, the patient is describing that as a vibration of light. So the light is constantly vibrating, and. Uh, and so he has to, and this is working very well for edge detection. Uh, and now we choose how to make content detection, not just edge, more efficient. And this is happening, but uh, again, there is a limitation, which is that we are targeting different types of million cells at the same time. I think that there's probably, uh, I'm going to assume that the length of time that someone has been, you know, without vision is probably going to um, you know, come in, come into play in terms of how quickly the, you know, what they're seeing, they can start recognizing because there's, you know, we've heard reports of, of this in the past, because you mentioned, you know, patients that receive an Argus 2 implant, for example, or uh, patients who, you know, maybe had, you know, uh, injury to their corneas early on in life and then had corneal uh, transplants later on in life. And all of a sudden they could see again, but it doesn't mean that their their brains were able to fully comprehend, you know, what things were. And I've heard of stories of patients having to, you know, touch things in front of them to start to, um, you know, integrate that information. Say, okay, that that's a chair or that's a, a box. Is that uh, similar in this situation, you think? Possibly, yes. Yeah, possibly, yes. I mean, it makes sense. But uh, I think, uh, as you know, the brain is a, is both an enigma and a fascinating machine. So I think vision occurs at the brain level. So even quite confusing signals that we were providing with Argus or Iris 2, and uh, now that we are providing with this type of stimulation, can be interpreted, but it takes time to, to learn about it. And uh, the experience has been, especially with artificial retina, that uh, it takes uh, several months of training to to just bring some uh, a correspondence between what is being perceived and the reality. So it's, it's, a, it's a work in, work in progress and a lot of brain plasticity occurs at, following that. So I know that you were saying that uh, one thing you tell the, uh... And I know someone who undergoes this procedure, you know, if they move their head or their eyes to kind of just help understand what they're seeing, just as somebody who has a visual impairment myself, I do that already. You know, there's a lot of, if I'm trying to walk outside and it's very common for people who have for RP and I'm sure with some other conditions as well, where you're constantly scanning your environment left and right, left and right, because it just kind of helps fill in, fill in the gaps of, of what's there so you can um, better perceive what's, uh, what's in your environment. Yeah, there are um, two reasons to that. One is uh, many patients with RP have very small visual fields, so they are using that to scan the environment, to reconstruct the environment. The other thing is that we know that uh, motion detection is uh, is more efficient than uh, static detection. Uh, we know that from visual field testing. So it's probably a way to enhance that, that uh, spontaneously patient identify. And even in these trials, part of it is coming from the patient themselves. No, that's no, it's interesting. So maybe just a couple more questions if, if you have time um, before we wrap up. Yeah, but sure. the, um, so is this going to be, this approach limited to people with um, RP or are there other um, retinal, degenerative retinal conditions or other types of eye conditions that you could point out that maybe could benefit from this same type of, um, the same type of approach? So currently, uh all will depend on the resolution we reach. Currently, we are going to move into the third court of patient with a higher titer. So hopefully there would be higher efficiency, at least to be demonstrated. And the goggles are being optimized uh, following input from patient, just also the technology being evolving. So if we reach a level of visual equity, that is a significant uh, then it would go beyond retinitis pigmentosa. It could be applying, for example, to age-related macular deformation, but this is a currently a, a, bit of a leap of faith because we, we just have to get to a better resolution and we are very hopeful that this is going to happen uh, before this can be extended to other disease. The limitation is that patients need to have a good optic nerve. If they have, for example, advanced glaucoma or trauma to the optic nerve, then this is not going to work because you need viable ganglion cells to, to be stimulated. Okay, no, that makes that makes sense. Now, 
um, I guess, how far do you think this could go? Or, or even without speculation, maybe how far would you like to be able to see this technology go? Like if you're, if it's, hopefully it's as simple as increasing the, you know, the, the titer um, of the virus and that leads to uh, higher resolution. Um, do you foresee a specific uh, limitation in terms of what visual acuity could be achieved based on the technique? So we did uh, mathematical simulations of that. And uh, in theory, the visual acuity could reach uh, 2080. Uh, so which would be quite an achievement because then with uh, zooming and things like that, you could do a lot of things. But this is, a, a, this is currently a model uh, that we made based on the recording we performed in animals. So these are not data coming from patients. So it just, we hope we'll be able to reach above 2200. Uh, but I can't promise that just something we want to do, but uh, we, we don't know yet. Yeah, but even you know, 2080 for someone who has 2020 sounds horrible, but for someone who, you know, just has, you know, hand motion, light perception or total blindness, 2080 is basically a miracle. I mean, that's, yeah, you know, you, that's, al that's almost at the limit of driving. I think, uh, you know, driving is somewhere around 2060, 2070, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it depends um, on the state, yeah. But, uh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, again, I uh, don't want people to misunderstand what I'm saying. We are not yet there. I mean, this is, this is a, a target, but, uh, this, yeah. But, but what it's done, I mean, you know, I, I agree, and it's still early in that sense, but what it's done is really, you know, open an entire new approach, right? Before we say we have, we have gene therapy or we have stem cell therapy, uh, you know, we had the, you know, these retinal implants and now we're looking at, uh, you know, directly, uh, these cortical implants, you've really just opened an entire new, um, approach to treating these diseases, which, uh, which is, is certainly exciting. So, uh, maybe just the last question, but I was hoping you could, you know, talk about what's next for, um, for your lab and, uh, and for the company is, is the company uniquely focused on, uh, on this challenge or are there other uh, branches to that or the research that your lab's doing? Yeah, so, well, my, my lab and uh, is working on different avenues. Uh, one is uh, corrective gene therapy uh, for the earlier stages of the disease. Uh, there is a very mainstream area, which is protection of remaining vision for patients that still have central vision. And I've been working on that, uh, uh, my lab, and I've identified a very good target that is uh, like an endogenous mechanism to maintain central vision. So this is moving into clinical trial, uh, hopefully next year, and a very promising approach. Uh, we keep working on artificial retina. We have an ongoing trial with the wireless uh, implant that we developed with Daniel Palanca at Stanford, uh, that is in clinical trial now in multi-center in Europe and uh, still in the US and uh, very promising. We also have an avenue on stem cells for retinal pigment epithelial replacement and also several projects that are more long-term on replacement of photoreceptors and optogenetics. So uh, we are developing uh, several new approaches uh, to target cone cells to uh, optimize the resolution, uh, optimizing the goggles. A uh, very important avenue of research for me is uh, low vision rehabilitation. So uh, maybe it will be something we could discuss another time, but we in Paris and now in Pisa, we put together an amazing group of people working from different angles on all the aspects of uh, visual impairment uh, and daily activities, uh, how to help people to cope with that uh, using assistive technologies and uh, also the metrics. And we have actually have an agreement with the FDA. We signed a memorandum of understanding to develop all the metrics for low vision assessment and uh, assessment of uh, any therapy or any technology that could help patients in daily life. With respect to Gensite, uh, Gensite is continuing to develop a program, uh, improving the goggles, and uh, certainly willing to continue and bring that to the market. I'm not uh, an executive in the company, I'm just advising them. And uh, there is another program that actually reported recently very good results on the gene therapy for labor's optic neuropathy, uh, mitochondrial disease of the optic nerve. So it's uh, the third uh, phase three trial and uh, successfully demonstrating uh, improvement of vision uh, in both eyes, actually, in patients that are treated. And uh, so now they're seeking approval in uh, Europe. They hope to obtain it next year. And uh, also discussing with the FDA 
potentially for the US. Uh, so this is the second product they are developing. Uh, also a very uh, breakthrough technology because this is mitochondrial disease, something that nobody had targeted before. Oh, wow. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot going on. It sounds like you've you've uh, you know got your hands in all of these different branches so yeah it's um, a, it's a, in a world you need a, you need to to use any possible resources so the institute i built in paris uh, has 300 people and uh, working on many approaches in, in parallel so it's like a parallel processing uh, with a lot of integration and convergence of the teams and same thing is happening in pittsburgh now it's really trying to tackle the problem from many angles knowing that there are many people across the world that do beautiful work and uh, there is a lot of collaboration in this field also no well this is uh this is fantastic i mean this has been really informative for me i mean i have some background in this but um i've definitely learned some things in the conversation and i'm sure that the the audience will have a, a lot of a lot of takeaways so i wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for for joining on the on the podcast today. it's certainly been a pleasure thank you for your interest and uh, your very good questions thanks so much <laughs> thank you and that concludes today's episode of the broad eye podcast if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Of course, ratings and reviews are always welcome. And you can certainly share this episode with any of your colleagues or friends who might enjoy it. Thanks for listening.